Okay, as we've only got an hour, I'm going to start and just let, you know, introduce everything slowly and let people arrive. Um, so my name's Fran Boyt and I'm the Executive Director at Positive Money um, and chairing today's webinar that we're hosting on how racism built our money and banking system. So we're really excited to be doing doing some more webinars as we many of us still find ourselves um, working from home. Uh, so we've got three coming up. This is the first of three that we're hosting this autumn, uh, exploring topics of race, inequality, debt and our unfair money, banking and wider economic system. So the next one, uh, which I'll remind you of at the end, will be in a couple of weeks time at the same time, 12.30 to 1.30. So we're hoping people can um, join over their lunch break if, if that's possible. Um, and that will be entitled Debt, Inequality and COVID-19, The Perfect Storm. So looking forward to that one. So for those of you who don't know Positive Money, we are a nonprofit that was set up after the financial crash 10 years ago. And our mission is to reform money and banking so that it enables a fair, democratic and sustainable economy, um, one which we find ourselves very far away from today. And this year we uh, have seen um, huge kind of upheaval uh, and we're keen to um, delve into some of those topics over the course of this webinar series. So I really welcome people to drop into the, the chat um, who they are and, and where they're from joining. Um, we've previously had a really international audience um, and so we're keen to know who you are and where you're from. Uh, so don't don't hold back. We've got over 150 people so far and hope and uh, I'm sure more coming as well. So to introduce today, um, this is uh, how racism built our, our money and banking system. And we saw in May this year, uh, George Floyd dying of being lynched over a $20 bill. And this feels like a symbol, not just of kind of generalized racism, but of institutionalized financial structures that discriminate and exclude people of color in our economy today. And whilst this summer, Positive Money did welcome the Bank of England and other financial institutions apologising for their ties with the slave trade, a simple apology is quite easy to do and, and obviously not, not really enough. So much of the, the wealth and size of our oversized financial sector and City of London was built um, on, the, on the slave trade. And so we must look deeper into the role of our money and banking system and its history to truly understand what actions are needed to address racial injustices and racial inequalities that we see in terms of the glaring racial wealth gap and income gap that is present in the UK today. We see those financially excluded in our money and banking system are not a random selection of citizens, but disproportionately black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. So it's a huge topic and we don't have long but luckily we do have a really fantastic panel of experts I'm really excited about uh, joining us today to share their insights and thoughts before we open it up uh, to the wider audience. So we'll start with Kai Hinde Andrews, Professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City University. His research focuses on resistance to racism and grassroots organisations and his latest book Back to Black Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century was published in 2018. He also wrote Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality and the Black Supplementary School Movement in 2013 and is the editor of Blackness in Britain book series with Z Books. He's also written opinion pieces for Guardian, Independent, Washington Post, CNN and is the founder of the Harambi Organization of Black Unity and co-chair of the Black Studies Association. We will then hear from Dr. Jaravia Jaffrey, who is a lecturer in international political economy at City University in London. She studies financial development in the global south, including inclusive finance, payment systems and impact investing strategies. Her doctoral research studied how shadow banking practices and networks shaped inclusive finance in Pakistan. She holds degrees from the University of Toronto in Canada 
and Shahid Zafiqa Ali Bhutto Institute of Science and Technology in Pakistan has several years of work experience in the financial sector itself. And then we'll be hearing from Dr. Carolina Alves, Joan Robinson Research Fellow in Heterodox Economics at Girton College, University of Cambridge, a co-founder of Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics. She's also an editor of the Development Economics blog and sits on the Rebuilding Macroeconomics Advisory Board and the Progressive Economy Forum Council. So really excited to hear from all of you, but before I hand over to speakers, I um, just want to again encourage people to also um, as well as saying where they're from in the chat, to feel free to start sharing um, questions in the uh, Q&A and we'll do our best to get through some of those. Uh, looks like we've got some people from Canada joining us at 4.30 a.m., some people from Chester and Bristol in the UK, so excited to hear more about where our audience is coming from. So I'll hand over to Kahinde to kick us off. Uh, all right. Um, good afternoon, I guess it is. Yes. Um, well, it depends where you are, I suppose. Uh, so thanks for the invitation and thanks for spending your lunch uh, lunch time with us. I'm still not 100% used to talking to myself in my front room, so bear with me. Uh, I'm just going to give a kind of very brief overview. I mean, I think one of the, so I've just finished uh, a book which comes out in February. Um, it's called I don't know if I call it. It's called The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World. And the whole premise of this book is built around a video we did for The Guardian a few years ago now called The West is Built on Racism. And, you know, when we think about any question about how does racism feature into any area of social life, we should just understand that racism is the literal founding stone of this political and economic system. So there is no corner which is separate from that. And the money in banking system is certainly not at all. In fact, the money in banking system is absolutely at the heart of that in every single way. Um, the idea that capitalism is racism probably has, hopefully has a, a lot of purchase nowadays. An excellent book uh, in that regard is Black Marxism by Cedric Robinson. But really, if you actually look at the development of capitalism, the development of the Western economy that we, we're currently in, you know, racism is its hallmark. Racism is what starts it. Racism is what fans it. And racism is still what runs it. And um, ec the economy is really important in that. Uh, so, in, uh, in the, so in the book, and I, you know, so I, I knew this before I wrote the book and then I did all the research for the book. And the devil really is in the detail uh, into just ha how, important, um, how important finance is. And capital and wealth generation was to um, and how slavery, colonialism and racism was to how we generate all the wealth that we currently have uh, that is in our finance systems at all. So if we go back to the, you know, the, the founding moment, the dawning of, of, of the West, would have to be uh, Columbus's sale to the Americas in 1492. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, was something we used to we talk about in school. Uh, we forgot to talk about uh, the fact that he was also one of Europe's first slave traders uh, and genocidal, uh, a genocidal tyrant who was responsible for the deaths of, literally for the deaths of millions of people. Um, but that movement to the West and why we actually call it, one of, well, I'm not sure this is why we call it the West, but this certainly is, it should be why we call it the West. That movement to the West was really important um, in terms of generating the necessary wealth for what we have now. So in 1492, uh, Europe was not ahead of the world. Like the, we think, kind of think of the idea that you know Europe and, and Western and it, it was almost naturally the leader, the the, the most wealthy, the, the leader in technology, etc. At this point, this was not the case. In fact, Europe was coming out of a dark age and may have been the only the only part of the world that was in a dark age at that point in time. Um, and the founding of the Americas was hugely important uh, to generate the wealth necessary for for the West to, to for Europe to take over for the West. Uh, to come into being. And the pillars of that, I mean, yes, you can talk about uh, industrial revolution, you can talk about politics, you can talk about all those kind of things, but the real pillars of that were the genocide in the Americas, the genocide so large, um, killed up to 98% of the native population in different parts of the, of the Americas. But a genocide so large that it actually warmed the earth. I still don't really understand how that worked, but that was, that was the impact of the genocide in the Americas, the amount of people who died. We're talking about tens of millions, probably about 70 million people. Um, and then that was followed by the enslavement of, again, tens of millions of Africans who were brought over from Africa, literally turned into subhuman 
animal like chattel who could be treated literally in, in, with a monetary value, right? Um, and traded to, 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 to build the commodities. Now, commodities here are important because the first thing that was firstly, um, the first jet driver of the slave trade uh, in the Americas was the Portuguese and the Spanish who were trying to find gold, right? Gold was such an important commodity, gold and silver. And it was this gold and silver rush that was the first thing which generated slavery and which started to build the wealth uh, in which the West was able to rise. And one of the ways it did this was the gold and silver was to trade with the East. The East at this point was definitely more advanced. Africa was certainly more advanced as well. A longer story there. Um, but um, this gold and silver trade with the East uh, managed to enrich the wealth, managed to build the West. And all the countries in the West, uh, in Europe, were, were, were even though they weren't necessarily directly involved in slavery, they were benefiting from this trade in commodities over into, over into the East. And this is where you start to see that the West got, begins to emerge, begins to become um, uh, more preeminent. And then it is in the conversion of um, Africans into, into capital, right? Um, that, that, that is, that's what allows this to happen, right? Through literally turning us into, 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 stu into, into a stock, if you like, into a, into a money, into a leasehold, into a, into a form of economic exchange. Um, and the, what really kicks off Western development, though, is when there's a shift from kind of gold and silver into the other commodities like sugar and cotton really in particular cotton becomes a huge and important commodity which is traded around etc cetera, etc cetera. and the slave plantations generate so much wealth over 300 years and all this wealth is brought into europe and it's, it's and, and becomes the workshop of the world and becomes the center of production etc and all this wealth is the wealth is used to make Europe preeminent. There, there can't be colonialism without slavery. There can't be slavery without genocide. There can't be the West without these terrible forms of colonial violence, uh, which underpin all the ways in which that wealth was was created. And then once you have that wealth, that allows you to have the banking system. It's not coincidental that the banking system is tied very, very neatly into slavery and, and colonialism in terms of its development. Uh, that's by design. Once you have this wealth, what do you do with it? Once you have monetary forms of exchange, what do you do with it? Um, if you look at even some of the language that's used, stocks, bonds, uh, would, would be tell you they were reminiscent of the time. And that wealth is the wealth that was absolutely essential to driving modern industry. Uh, the, the, we, Birmingham, where I currently am and live, is you know famous for industrial revolution people like james watt matthew bolton where did they get where did they get their wealth from to invest and develop etc etc from the profits from slavery you know the first thing that was produced the first thing that went through the um spinning through the through james watt steam engine uh, it was refined it was a sugar refinery in the in the in the caribbean so you know, you have all this wealth and you have a, a banking system that is then put in to, to, to deal with the wealth, right? To deal with it, where does it go? How does it, how is it used? What, what, what kind of system is set up to deal with that? Now, interestingly, the bank, I'm kind of ranting on a bit earlier. We come up some in the, in the Q&A. But I want to kind of focus on the Bank of England for a second because the Bank of England did apologize for its role in slavery, but kind of ignored its actual role in slavery. Um, the Bank of England's role in slavery wasn't just that. It was, it had some, well, almost all of its first um, founders uh, were, were slave owners or, or had money from slavery. That's how much money there was in, the, in, the, in, in how much money, the wealth there was from slavery in Britain at that time. Um, but actually, you couldn't have slavery without the banking finance system. You couldn't have slavery without loans uh, from banks to, uh, to, uh, so they could float and people could, could actually start slave trading businesses. You couldn't have slavery without insurance. Thinking about insurance, thinking about Lloyds of London, you couldn't, you couldn't have slavery without insurance mechanism. So actually some of these mechanisms actually come about precisely because of something like the slave trade. And the one area where the Bank of England was totally myopic in its, in, in its statement was, you know, after slavery uh, is abolished in, the, in Britain and the colonies, it's abolished uh, because the British government pays the biggest, still is to this day, the biggest amount of money the government's ever paid for anything, uh, which was a hundred billion pounds, 5% of GDP in 1834, 5% GDP now is about hundred billion pounds, hundred billion pounds uh, paid to the slave owners as compensation for their losses, right? So this huge transfer of wealth was given uh, to the slave owners in order to, for them to be benevolent enough to end the system of slavery. Now, that's important because when was this money paid off? It's paid off in, so, sorry, the, sorry, the government paid this but didn't have the money. They had to take a loan to pay this off. It was so huge, 40% of uh, the British government's budget at the time. And they took this loan from where? 
the Bank of England and only paid this loan off in 2015, which means that myself, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great great, and my descendants of the enslaved have actually been paying off compensation to slave owners until 2015, which just tells you how this isn't something in the past. This is very much something which is still with us. The legacy of us is very much still alive. Uh, and the wealth from slavery is still definitely with us uh, and colonialism. And also so is the poverty as well. And it still shapes the modern world. I will stop there. Thank you so much, Kahinde. That was fantastic. I'll hand over to Javeria now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that's really um, um, interesting and very relevant to, to um, um, my own notes, actually. So um, I just wanted to sort of begin by, by drawing everyone's attention to this uh, recent report from uh, the Runnymede Trust. It's called The Color of Money. It's, um, it's a report about racial inequality. And, um, and, and some numbers from it, just to give you a sense, right? So uh, we know uh, from this report that black African and Bangladeshi households, uh, for instance, have 10 times less wealth than white British people. And this is a, there, there's very useful analysis over here because it's, it's sort of at this granular level, it sort of explains how wealth accumulation um, in the past, such as through buying property, um, and sort of other assets can, can explain the uneven structure of wealth in uh, the UK today. But what I want to sort of specifically draw um, attention to just, just for a little bit is the, the actual title of the report, right? So it's called The Color of Money, How Racial Inequalities Obstruct a Fair and Resilient Economy, right? And um, that's fine. That sort of covers exactly what the report's about. But I think uh, um, an, an assumption from that sort of title is that inequality sort of stand in the way of a better economy. They stand in the way of a fairer or re more resilient e economy. Um, but I think another way to look at this might be to sort of see how the economy itself stands in the way of um, a fairer, more resilient, more, um, you know, even or um, equal rather society, right? And, and this is the context in which I want to discuss a specific part of the economy, right? And that part of the economy is the financial system, right? Uh, now here in the UK, uh, we, we've seen after, um, you know, with the Black Lives Movement, after the murder of George Floyd, that there has been, um, uh, you know, an interest in some unwelcome and, you know, often uncomfortable decisions about, about slavery and colonialism, right? And that, that's... Um, you know, um, essentially what Kainde has been talking about, right? How, how it's very, it's, it's impossible really to uh, separate institutions that, that still persist and are hugely influential, like the city of London, for instance, from a uh, history of colonialism and slavery, right? And even though slavery was abolished in the 19th century, we, we see that racial inequality still persists, right? And um, what we, what we have essentially is a financial system that has um, not only, uh, not, is not only a product of these inequalities, but has also constantly designed and redesigned itself to benefit um, from these inequalities, right? So um, just to give you a little um, sort of examples from the US, right, which is quite relevant, there is, um, um, if, if you sort of look back at the history of sort of ra the racial wealth gap and accumulation, you see that there was this phenomenon um, shortly after the abolition of slavery of black banks, right? Now, what is a black bank? A black bank was essentially a bank that served only black people. And why do you need banks like that? Because uh, they couldn't go to banks that were, you know, owned or um, established for white people, right? So there's this constant um, struggle for, for the black communities in, in the, the US to access very basic things like credit or um, uh, just, um, you know, even, even to sort of place their savings in a deposit, right? And because these black banks were, were owned by black people who were not as wealthy or influential or well-connected as their white counterparts, they were constantly failing. So there's this constant cycle of, of people losing their savings and, and being devastated and, and losing confidence essentially in, um, in the financial system, right? And then this sort of system continues into more recent years with this phenomenon of, uh, of redlining, right? Now redlining, for, for those of you who don't know, is basically just, um, you know, making certain parts of a map red and those red parts um, indicate where um, essentially where banks shouldn't lend. So they're considered high risk areas. And you, um, if you're a banker, you don't want to issue mortgages to people coming from um, who live in those areas, right? So where, whereas it might be illegal to discriminate on, on the basis of race and refuse someone a mortgage on that basis, it's not illegal to sort of make an assessment on, um, you know, the neighborhood they're, they're, they're sort of buying property in, right? And there was this constant uh, fear um, among um, 
uh, in white neighborhoods to not become redlined, right? To not sort of become a ghetto. And every time um, a black family would sort of move in, there was this um, issue about house prices falling, right? And there's and and, and it's all circular, right? Because you you've bought this property for um, wealth accumulation, but but you've actually seen that prices in the neighborhood fall. So it, it's this, this sort of system of um, of um, a wealth accumulation being um, skewed and and uneven uh, depending on um, on race, right? And uh, that's the U.S. example. And um, what we what we see uh, with redlining is this this phenomenon of reverse red red redlining, right? And that actually relates very closely to what we've seen in the UK. So reverse redlining was when when you see that um, in, in certain areas where regular banks refuse to operate and offer sort of insurance, mortgages, lending, and so on, you see um, institutions like payday lenders pop up, right? So these are predatory institutions. They're exploitative and they're obviously going to charge uh, a much higher rate with a you know, smaller suite of services just because they know they can get away with it, right? Just because they know that regular banks are not going to lend in certain areas. So that's where they pop up, right? And we see the same phenomenon in the UK, right? And now to really understand why that happens, we want to get into what, um, uh, you know, the structure of banks is like, what is their profit model, right? So we saw this phenomenon in, in the 1990s. And there are a number of financial geographers who who sort of, um, covered this quite extensively. So there's the work of Andrew Lation and um, Gary Dimsky particularly, uh, which is very re relevant. And they talk about this uh, phenomenon called financial abandonment and uh, financial infrastructure withdrawal, where you uh, see that, um, you know, ov over like a certain period, there's a large scale um, closure of many, many banks. And a lot of people find that they have to travel sort of five, six miles, even more to get to the nearest bank branch, right? And what happens in this sort of, um, and these areas particularly, they're, they're working class areas. There are large communities of migrants over there. There are um, quite a few elderly. So it's, um, it's sort of people who are already disadvantaged, who are being sort of further disadvantaged by the system. And in this sort of environment, you have lots of payday lenders, um, institutions like Wonga and uh, so on sort of pop up and, and start uh, taking um, advantage of these populations. Now, why, why has this happened? This has happened essentially because there's been a very strong shift in the way banking is done, in the way banking banks have designed themselves and in the way the financial structure has sort of evolved, right? And um, if, if you really want to sort of see this shift, I think uh, a really good resource is this film called uh, It's a Wonderful Life. It's often on at Christmas. And, and then the main character in that is this guy called uh, George Bailey, who runs this sort of community bank. And he's struggling to sort of save the bank from being closed or, or being taken over by... Um, Profit seekers, right? And in the, and in that, you sort of get this sense that the 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 bank is is there not just to make profit, but it's it's part of a community, right? So collapse of a bank, like a run on a bank, would mean a collapse of a community because not only have people placed their savings over there, but those savings have gone on to fund people's um, businesses, their enterprises, their companies, and and their livelihoods essentially, right? But that model has um, is disappearing. It's um, to a large extent, it's already gone. And, uh, and in, in that uh, model, which we had in the UK as well, you would have this um, sort of arrangement where banks are keen to get not only depositors, but also people to lend to. So they, so they want people to put their money in the bank, but they also want to use that money to lend on to people. So you're constantly building relationships. Uh, now the contemporary model has, has shifted, right? So we've seen this shift from what is sometimes called um, originate to hold, OTD, to uh, O, oh, sorry, OTH to OTD, which is originate to distribute. And banks now, uh, instead of lending the money and looking for profit, like through that model, are sort of more interested in, sorry, I can hear um, an echo. That's fine, sorry. I've posted it, should be okay now. Okay. You've got one minute left, by the way. Almost done. And so rather than lend um, to, to individuals or companies, banks are now sort of able to just make investments, right? So they invest in another company and then that company invests somewhere else and then they break it up and they turn that investment into something else. And, you know, that investment might be, for instance, in subprime mortgages, right? And then we, and we saw what happened with that, right? So that not only are they contributing to a system that's quite exploitative and, um, and unstable, they, they've essentially sort of lost interest in cultivating any kind of uh, relationship with the community or, or any sort of um, geographical orientation, right? Now, now that's uh, that's sort of the UK um, context, or, or or describes really what we have, in, uh, what we know as an Anglo-American model. But there's a global context as well, right? Because these uh, investments are often um, 
outside of the UK, right? So a lot of the money that a depositor might a depositors might place in the UK winds up outside the UK, and it's going to fund um, initiatives like, for instance, microfinance, um, impact investing, and so on, right? And now the question is, why why are um, clients abroad, often in, in sort of poor emerging developing countries, interested in, in, in these funds from the UK, right? Why, why are, have their own financial systems not been able to sort of cater to this need, right? And, and then when you, once you get into that, you see that there's this entire sort of architecture infra infrastructure of, of regulation that prevents them from doing so, right? So banks um, in, in smaller countries are, are prevented from um, lending to who they choose. There, there's something called a set of Basel regulations. There's also another set of regulations from the G7 under the Financial Action Task Force. And these are very, very restrictive, right? So it, it's much easier for them to sort of get money from a fund, turn that into a microfinance loan and lend it to poor people in their own country rather than sort of generate their, their own system. And, um, you know, another third uh, sort of feature which we can talk about later mm -hmm. is this sort of connection between the global financial industry and, and this massive um, offshore financial um, infrastructure. So where you have tax havens and where sort of large corporations avoid tax, which would otherwise be, you know, used for redistributive um, um, purposes or, or for public, uh, more accessible public services. Um, but yeah, Thank that's you. it. Thank you. Yeah, that was a huge amount of information. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand over to our last speaker, Carolina. Thank you, Fran. So yeah, and thank you very much for this invitation. It's an amazing and timely event. So I'm very happy to be here and trying to contribute a little bit. So uh, uh, my talk, I think it would be in a way, uh, complement uh, this um, you know fantastic um, contest we have from kinded on uh, what, how we actually deal with racism and colonialism and how that is still kind of the role of racism and colonialism in, in the world and also with uh, Javeria, uh, 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 Javeria description of this uh, racist practices that we have within our credit and, and, and banking system. And the way I'm going to do that is trying to then focus on how economics as a discipline sees all this, or maybe perhaps, you know, it does not see it, <laughs> all this. And that's going to be where I, I, I want you to focus on. And uh, I will start uh, that discussion um, highlighting that uh, it's impossible to try to understand uh, all the points that have been discussed up to now for the question of uh, racism if you don't really have this concept of uh, systemic racism, uh, you know, very clear, which is this practice of racism that is embedded in our everyday life, whatever we like or not, <laughs> whatever we know or not. And that's not only in our own individual behavior, but also, also in the institutions that uh, is around us, how we design that institutions, which, you know, it goes back to what uh, kind of was trying to, to explain to us. And uh, this starting point is very important for economics as it's, you know, as a discipline and it's teaching and research. Because, and then, of course, how we teach the issues of banking and finance. And I want to try to make two points why it's very important why this systemic racism is important and what happens when we don't really consider then in our analysis. And of course, there are more aspects to, to kind of unpack, but we'll focus on two. So the first one is, you know, I guess the question for us is, okay, how economics is dealing with all this? How economics is dealing with racism? How economics is dealing with the systemic racism? And um, the way I see economics, you know, here I'm really focusing on the mainstream economics. Uh, economics has dealt with race uh, just at extended in a you know extensive way looking to racial economic inequalities okay so basically looking to this black and white economic inequality and of course into black poverty but my perspective and i'm going to go through very quickly here and you can go back to that during the question uh time uh, I think that approach from you know, the mainstream approach is not inadequate to tackle or to understand racial economic inequality because obviously of its assumptions, you know, it, it, because it doesn't have a realistic approach to race and racism and specifically to race as uh, the social construct. And uh, what I, I'm basically I'm focusing here in two 
on two models, the trade models, which is the Becker taste discrimination model and the human capital uh, theory models, which is where we see the statistical discrimination which is this relationship between race and productivity. So, I mean, again, we can really go through details uh, during the question time, but uh, very um, broadly, what's the problem with these two models, right? Regardless of their developments and, 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 and so on. First of all, we don't move away from the mainstream assumption that link between wages uh, which is the price of the labor and marginal productivity of labor. So basically, you know, in that word, labor is paid what is worth. That's it, full stop. You know, race is not direct a, a problem here. And the same aspect of imperfect competition, of perfect competition, because as we know, that's the assumption as well. So this wage, wages differential between black and white workers supposed to disappear in the long term, in the long run, in that framework, but it doesn't. So we never have a, a sufficient approach for you know, explanation why it doesn't. Yes, we will have imperfect competition models, but still we have some of the assumptions of non-classical mainstream awards that stop us to, to kind of understand and tackle what racism is. And what is interesting here is that there's nothing wrong with the economic system, either in Becker's role, world on the human uh, capital theory world, because in the first case, well, as we know, this taste discrimination is exogenous. So, you know, that's the explanation of black poverty. In the other case, you know, there's the question of productivity, statistical discrimination, that's the explanation of black poverty, and it's all external factors from our marketplace, right? So the economic system, there's nothing wrong with the economic system. We're not really discussing why racism exists in the first place. And that's complicated because uh, the consequence of that is what we see if you extrapolate your analysis, you see that all these models are dealing or indirectly or indirectly, they're treating black people as if they are someone inferior, somehow deficient, there's something deficient about black people, which goes back to kind of, kind of legacy regarding colonialism, this kind of uh, how our view of the world has been fed, has been informed based on this hierarchical idea of race. So that's the first point of how economics is dealing with race. The second point, which I'm gonna go very quickly because again, kind of gave a, a brilliant uh, talk on that, which is, you know, when you look back on these developments of modernity enlightenment is when we see economics as a discipline kind of emerging. And here, we, we kind of understand this period of a period of rationality, technological development. So capitalism is now is th this kind of, uh, best thing since sliced bread, as they say. So what's happening here is the question of colonialism, slave trade, structural racism, they are often ignored and neglected. But most important, mostly, most importantly, the language of economics emerged as neutral, objective, you know, is that's how we learn economics, right? So there is this kind of, we conceal this power imbalances, these structural inequalities. And that claim of objective that we like so much in economics, it doesn't consider the political, the historical context, doesn't consider uh, especially this legacy of uh, colonialism, which is, you know, a problem because what's happened here, we naturalize capitalism, so that's, we don't study the history of capitalism and its link with uh, colonialism. And then, you know, the scholarship on this legacy of colonialism and impact on the banking industry, financial industry, development, industrialization, the institutions, distribution of wealth is, is not linked to any kind of this discussion on legacy. And that's, that is a problem. So economists, they have to come to accept and understand how our view of the world has been formed by these assumptions that justify the colonial rule in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Middle East. And you have to investigate then the knowledge production we have there in its relation with slavery and colonialism. So if you don't do that, you can't have a satisfactory, satisfactory answer for both. You know, how the bank system works, but also a better society. And a very quick point here, if I have problem, fine, okay for time? Just Perfect. a minute. That's all I need. So what's happening here, if you really, for example, have a quick look on how we teach, you know, banking finance for our third year, uh, and uh, one aspect of this teaching is the credit and development, which is basically about looking to economic growth and economic development, you know, emphasizing the role of institutions and in financial development. So 
you know, as we probably would say, wow, plenty of room to talk about systemic racism. Let's, let's do it, right? But here we are teaching our students model of misallocation, micro foundation of boring constraint, micro evidence of boring constraint, you know, fric financial frictions. There is no space for race or systemic racism. And it's not really about going back to that course and say, okay, you have to include that in demand from, you know, whoever is putting the syllabus together to talk about racism, because it's the theoretical apparatus that doesn't uh, give space to make that discussion. So if you demand a kind of, uh, if you demand from the discipline to discuss racism with this theoretical apparatus, we're just gonna have it, what we've been saying, which is let's add this variable for race, like and something extra, right? And it shouldn't be, should it, because the issue is deeper, right? So we need to understand how in this international development we have what uh, Pile called white gaze problem, which is a, you know is as amazing because what she's saying is all this international development, this the issue of credit has this social, this kind of racist construct. What that means is we are looking and designing these institutions with this idea of whiteness as the signifier for progress, modernity, expertise. So everything that's not there is not really you. you know, everything that's not related to this whiteness is not associated with progress. So we have to break away from that. And you can, I can, we can discuss more how we can do that but that's it thank you Fran. <laughs> thank you caroline thank you to all our speakers I feel like we've like covered some like um pretty chunky topics and managed to get our way through his the history um also i appreciate your perspective on mainstream economics and their their role in upholding white supremacy um is it really crucial and also yeah the kind of in-depth details that you gave us so don't have so long left and I'm keen to get in a few questions. I mean, a lot of them are, you know, kind of wanting to understand more and also what we can do. So I'm just going to pose one question from me and then a couple from the audience and we'll see if we can do um, two rounds of three questions, if that's okay. And feel free as the speakers to pick up on anything um, other speakers said, because I feel like, you know, uh, it's just a lot covered, so happy to kind of repeat things um, to put the point across. Um, so my question is around um, kind of drawing parallels, and obviously we've heard a really, you know, important, you know, the, the finance system we have today was built off the back of genocide, and and everything is connected through that history. But um, you know, if we think about the kind of intricacies, I guess, of the financialization we see today, and we see, um, you know, the slave trade was. Uh, really kind of a crucial step in financialization of in terms of ma making human lives turned into profit making financial instruments um, can we kind of see those parallels with the financial instruments we see today that are designed to kind of extract rent from powerless individuals um, and similarly can we draw parallels between the bailouts we saw um, where the slave traders were essentially bailed out and like you said that the, the kind of people working people had to pay in order to which only finished in 2015 in order to end slavery and some of the bailouts we've seen um in the last 10 years obviously most recently with with covid where corporates have received up to a billion pounds without any strings so that's my kind of question and then bringing in a couple of audience members um Ro robinson asks you know, how can we respond as kind of citizens to the kind of critique that, you know, in a simple way that, um, you know, this happened ages ago, so we can't hold banks responsible for it now. And obviously you've touched on that, but some further um, points would help. Um, and there was a question from James Barker to Kai Hinde, which was, should the descendants of those who became wealthy through owning and trading slaves have an obligation to repay some of that money um, to, to the British government in, to, in terms of the fact that their ancestors benefited or thoughts on reparations, I guess, more generally would be great. Um, so which speaker would like to kick off with a response to, to any of that? Um, those questions. Yeah, should we go to uh, Jurevia and then uh, Kayinde? Uh, yeah, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about um, the financialization, right? Because uh, I think scholars of financialization sort of love to talk about 
when when it started and is it is it you know actually like a, a distinct sort of epoch or is it sort of just a continuation of um, you know of things that that we've um, that we've already seen before right and um, and I think so, when you're drawing parallels, I, th I think an interesting sort of parallel right now is the whole discussion on um, sort of climate change and the environment, right? Because there, there there's um, because the financial sector is, is is sort of there's this growing sense that they're complicit in this sort of degradation, and if there is supposed to, if you know, if there is expected to be any kind of sort of restructuring. Or, or drastic change, then, then the financial sector will sort of have to change it, it, its own practices uh, very, very drastically, right? And uh, I, I think what's important to sort of remember is, is that especially what we see, you know, over here in, in our sort of domestic context in the UK or, or in sort of just a broader Anglo-American context has very much to do with sort of changes that we've seen over the late 70s and 80s, right? Where, where the um, where financial power was sort of taken away from the state, right? So rather than, um, you know, the state making loans or sort of, um, you know, selecting like how, how the industry or, or the market should be shaped, it was uh, increasingly placed in private hands, right? And, and, and that obviously that goes back to this bigger discussion about capitalism itself and the profit motive, right? Because a lot of things um, can't be achieved if, if sort of the end game is, is just profitability, right? And... Um, on, on the bailouts, I think, um, um, you know, we're talking about sort of bailouts again, right, with the pandemic, and we're talking about sort of who's going to get bailed out and, and what is sort of the role of the government in, um, in upholding um, industry, right? And I, and I think um, over here, like, you know, the thing to think about really is, is what extent do bailouts enhance inequality, right? So, so you know, on one level, it, it's fine, you know, people are being furloughed and people are sort of being... Um, um, you know, given the means to, to continue their livelihoods, right? But then on the other hand, and you um, increasingly find that, that the sort of longer term effects are, are not even, right? So, you, you know, if you, if you bail out a company that is, um, you know, quite heavily involved in, in um, devastating the environment, then that's not the same as, um, you know, bailing out someone, someone else, for instance. So, yeah, that's all for me. Thanks so much. Can I pass to you, Kain um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think certainly there's, there's many a parallel uh, between if you look at the way that, you know, human life is devalued in the, in the, in the pursuit of profit. And we see that all the time. Like, there's a reason why your clothes are manufactured uh, by people in sweatshops in, like, in the in, in black and brown world, right? Because like, we can literally accept that the conditions in which they are live uh, can mean we can pay them pennies, right? I mean, that, that's, I mean, these logics, the logics haven't gone anywhere, right? We live in white supremacy is what shapes uh, global inequality. Just look at any map of the world, uh, GDP per capita, it's the white countries at the top, it's Africa at the bottom and, and a hierarchy in between. That's literally the definition of white supremacy that came through the Enlightenment. So we're still living that in a very real way. Uh, and bailouts in the same way. So the, the government will bail out industries which are uh, essential to the economy, which tells you just how essential uh, slavery was to the economy. And also they're racialized. So for example, the before COVID, the biggest bailout uh, in recent memory was the banks. Well, then actually the bank collapse was caused by uh, racialized lending, subprime mortgages, as they called them, subprime mortgages. That was to mostly black and brown people in America who had these terrible mortgages with the, for the, for, to live in terrible conditions, and that's what collapsed the system. Who got the money? It wasn't the people who were the victims of it. It was the banks, which are still going and are still thriving. Um, and so you can see that logic plays out there uh, also. I think that goes to the question of how can you respond to the critique that this happened ages ago? Um, yes, slavery ended, but the logic that black life doesn't matter, of white supremacy, of exploitation based on race, did not go anywhere. It's still very clearly with us um, and really financialized as well. So if you look at um, the third world debt, if you look at the trade, the way that trade works, if you look at the way that we just literally steal um, the resource wealth out of Africa uh, to make things, I mean, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have any of this conversation with all this technology that we use. Um, unless we'd literally just stolen the resources out of, out of the African continent. So the logic is still very much there, it hasn't gone anywhere. And also the legacies of this are very much there as well. If the wealth from slavery and colonialism is still with us, then the poverty is still with us. The reason Africa is poor is because of that history and continued presence of racial exploitation. Um, and so I get to the, I mean, the thing about the reparations question, that we have to first understand that everybody here, including me actually, ironically, we're in a funny situation now, right? Like, I also benefit from racial logics. Uh, I am now one of the top 
I don't know, three percent paid in the entire world, something crazy like that. Like if you just look at the imbalance between those who live in the West and those who don't, um, you know, we all benefit from um, the legacies of slavery, colonialism, etc. And yeah, of course, there should be a, there should be a debt should be paid. Uh, the only real qu problem with the reparations question is, you know, the amount of money we're talking about would literally destroy the political and economic system. And so, really, what we should be saying is, we just need a newer, fairer uh, political and economic system. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Karina, would you like to come in on any of those questions? Yes. That, great. Yeah. Uh, should I go? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, just a few, a few comments on financialization. I, I mean, I, I think um, the point is, as uh, Kinda Red said, you know, if we are considering the idea of uh, racial capitalism, not just capitalism, so our entire analysis would actually consider how uh, you know the entire functioning of uh, the financial system is in, in indeed based on slavery, violence, imperialism, and etc. So if so, it's like if you a big you're very clear about the legacy of. Um, the likes of colonialism and then how that impacts inequality, the inequality we see, you know, racial inequality, because then when you look at whatever is financialization, right, but that's just <laughs> close into like think in terms of financial innovations, for example. So if you look into all this financial innovation that we have in the financial system and, you, and the positive way we are welcoming this, if you don't have a perspective where you consider this inequalities that we are inheriting from this colonial past, we are going to, for example, we're going to look at what the Treasury did when it ended slavery in the, U in the UK and see that as a super creative solution, <laughs> as actually has been tweeted two years ago by the Treasury, right? Oh, look how we ended, look at how creative we are. But if you have this conception of the world where you're considering the legacy of colonialism, you'd think twice how you deal with all this financial innovation. So, and and, and from that perspective, I think we'll, financialization sometimes in a more in a, in a heterodox world, of course, there's all the link with uh, the change we have in the 30, you know, 40 years. But more broadly, you know, if you're trying to understand this is development of the financial system, we can't really move away from this idea of racial capitalism. So you can draw parallels, uh, you know, in the case of microfinance that uh, Jouvray probably can say much better than me, but also the question of uh, access to finance that we have with the international financial organizations, right, trying to promote this development of uh, the financial system in developing countries without considering, as already has been said, this uneven development we have between the core and the periphery which is also linked to colonialism so you just come up as international organizations with this idea of access to finance to promote economic growth and now 30 years later we are picking up the pieces of that consequences and a lot of that is because we didn't consider the legacy of colonialism what actually are the drivers between the core and the periphery so i think we need to bring that to our uh, analysis uh, regarding the um, how to respond uh, the you know uh, uh, to all this claim how colonialism is still very much um, uh, you know in our day everyday life one thing I like to say to my students to myself is to have to have to kind of have the sense of uh, how privileged we are and be constantly critic to you know this self-critic vigilance to how we understand history how we narrate history how we uh, you know, are, are describing the world. I think that's the, you know, what we can do is how we actually question our own worldview. You know, what is behind that? I think this is the, the main way. And I have one comment on reparation. It's definitely not my <laughs> uh, field of uh, expertise, but I think um, sometimes reparation is seen in a very negative way in the sense that it's just this kind of a specific financial remuneration for something that's long, you know, really in the past. And, and I think especially in the case of the US, I haven't really looked into the case of the UK, it's very clear, you, you really can tra trace down the consequence of how uh, black people that were owner, owners of land in the US, for example, how they were taxed, how they lost their land, and trace down people who actually caused, inflict that, and so on. And, and I think this is an important history that should be said. But what's happening in the US right now is that not even the investigation of this history is allowed, right, has been accepted, let alone the idea of reparation, which actually was much more, much more welcoming in the 40s and the 50s, 
for example. So we really have also to start reviewing our prejudice against the idea of preparation just associated with this financial you know, uh, aspect of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. I feel like, um, yeah, there's just so much to talk about on all of these. I'm gonna, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm gonna give you a couple of quite, hopefully quick questions. Um, and yeah, do feel free to kind of bring in any other points. So one question, I guess, maybe more for Carolina, it'd be great to hear from all of you that came in from Ak um, Atif Khan is just around mainstream uh, economics and how they can, I mean, obviously we've seen some incremental change since the crash of kind of mainstream economics and the kind of, um, a kind of a bigger movement of people challenging like neoclassical economic models and the idea of you know neutrality and some of the things you brought up but you know how can we take that further when we consider um, race and, and white supremacy is there any you know further insights you can give us of, of how we can kind of um, encourage mainstream ec economists to, to kind of take these things seriously without kind of telling them they have to become a, a totally pluralist economist, I guess. Maybe that's not possible. Um, and another question which might have a um, obvious answer, it would be great to have all of your points is, is, is racialization intrinsic to capitalism? Um, we've had slavery and apartheid, but is the 21st century, in the 21st century, um, is there such a thing as non-racist capitalism or does it invariably rely upon the exploit of, of perceived racial or ethnic differences? And that's come from um, Mike Hope. Um, and I, just one more question from Elspeth in Edinburgh. Um, I mean, she kind of talks about the, the interconnectedness of this kind of parts of this monster system that we've kind of all grown up in and is kind of intrinsic to the way we work so that it's, you know, it's almost like psychologically entwined is it as kind of white white supremacy in our heads and so how do we kind of confront this um can the panels kind of um can the panelists give us a, their view on on places to apply pressure for change um and yeah thoughts on thoughts on that would be great uh anyone feel like should we start maybe we'll, we'll go in a different order start with you carolina to take the first question um, especially on the mainstream economics, if that's okay. And I'm going to ask you to keep your answers pretty pretty short because we're running out of time. Yeah, of course. Well, I agree. The mainstream economics uh, has indeed, like you know, kind of uh, done done some changes and challenges neutrality. Uh, I think the f for me, very quickly, but there is, you know, uh, with Decon, with this organization, I'm part of, we've been coming up with alternatives. But I think the main point here is how we really address the curriculum, uh, the curriculum in economics and uh, in how we make them to center this idea of racial capitalism uh, and the idea of systemic discrimination because if you, you know, of course the journal to then how we look into, you know, econometrics, how we look into, I don't know, micro and bring that in is an entirely different issue. But right now we're not even bringing that discussion to, uh, to, to the, the departments of economics. And I think also this kind of discussion should be compulsory for the education of an economist. It's not just, you know, optional module. And that's also about the history of slavery and colonialism. Uh, so I think this is uh, definitely something we need to push. Otherwise, you know, the future generation will still be struggling to deal with that. And you're not going to be able to get to the point where we look into specific modules such as econometrics and trying to work it out what is actually the legacy of colonialism here in that paper. We don't even get that discussion. So I think this is what we need to do. We need to push to bring racial capitalism to the center of our discussion in economics because I think it's center. You can't really try to look at society without considering racial capitalism, which takes us to the, the last question. Uh, so yeah, so that's what I would, I, I mean, as I said, I can uh, talk more in terms of what, how we can do that. Uh, we only have a list of, um, of um, actions we, we want to push. Uh, so is that the only question Fran I had to address? Uh, yeah, that's fine. We can, we, we can come back if there's any other quick points you've got at the end. Sure. Um, Kahinde, are you okay to go next? Um, yeah, I mean, I think look, the key thing is to understand that the reason that mainstream economics or the mainstream sociology, etc., that doesn't have these analyses is because is that's the point, right? These are actual, I think we should start to understand that 
our school system and I include university in there is essentially propaganda for the racist social order like you can't like there is well, I think we have to really get this like if you don't understand if you don't have an analysis that centers race in in any of these disciplines it's just bad but unfortunately that is what it is that's that is the mainstream diet at which we're fed so it's time and I think this is a big thing that people need to get used to is that we have to get rid of these models like there's just no place for a model that doesn't have race if you want to have a proper account of what happens next and I had and I had this debate with myself in the book because I was writing about the enlightenment and thinking about thinkers like Kant and typically my approach had been well you know you can still teach Kant and, no Kant's awful just get rid of him you don't need him <laughs> like this is how we have to start the, the, the things we've been told are absolutely central need to be kicked away and we need to start again because there is not because to answer the second question there is no capitalism without racism like it might be possible to imagine a system where capitalism develops without racism but that is not the world we live in. The capitalism we have is intrinsically bound up in racism, as are most of our models of understanding it. So it's time to create new models of understanding it. Thanks so much. Um, Javeria, would you like to comment on any of those uh, um, questions? You can repeat any if that's helpful. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, um, I, I mean, I completely agree with uh, Carolina and Kind. So I'm just going to sort of talk about uh, one other point that you raised, which was about pressure points, right? And, uh, and I think like within the financial system, there's, you know, there, there's plenty of discussion on, on sort of what parts can be reformed, right? And I'll just give you three examples, right? So one is, is essentially like the banking system itself, right? And, uh, and, and, and now we know enough about sort of this private disintermediated sort of model to, to know that uh, it's, um, you know, it's not help one who's, who's not super rich, essentially, right? It's, it's designed to multiply wealth and wealth, you know, if you're going to ben benefit from multiplying wealth, if you've already got lots of it, and if you've got less, you're going to benefit less and that gap is going to constantly grow, right? And that's a huge deal, um, you know, if you have no wealth to accumulate and you're sort of, um, you know, in this environment where you're competing or your, your interests are sort of being undermined by those with huge, huge amounts of wealth, right? So the financial system itself is, is, is structured like that to, to um, you know, advantage certain types of people, right? Then related to that is just, you know, the simple, you know, matter of taxation, right? So, um, you know, we can debate about whether the capitalist system has this capacity to sort of, uh, you know, accommodate change and all of that. And, 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 and this sort of debate took place, uh, you know, about, 60 years ago or so, right? When you have what Polanyi calls the, the double movement and, and how sort of capitalism adjusted itself um, to, to sort of, you know, avoid collapsing or being destroyed, right? And, and the tax system is still a viable mechanism for addressing many of the inequalities that we see today, right? So certain types of redistribution can be done like fairly sim simply with, with, with some very, very basic reforms, right? So I'm talking about things related to healthcare, education, and, and so on, right? And uh, the third thing that I just want to mention, the third sort of pressure point is uh, is, is regulation, right? So somebody has actually mentioned that um, in, in the Q&A, right? So just to elaborate a little bit on that, just just things like like the Basel regulation, right? They do actively, um, I sort of said Basel, uh, uh, that's, um, yeah, the sort of set of regulations that applies to, to um, you know, banks of a certain size, and also the financial action task force restrictions, which, which regulate how money moves around the globe, right? And these sorts of restrictions are multiplying inequalities, right? Because they are impeding banks from functioning and allowing businesses to grow their capital, right? So there is this, if you're a large corporation, so if you're, you know, Apple or Facebook, you have huge advantages. You, you, you can avoid tax, you can avail um, offshore centers, you can um, you know, accumulate wealth in a certain way. Whereas if you're a smaller company, you might not even be able to get basic credit to do certain things. And, and these are um, things that can be you know, changed fairly simply with, um, with the changes in regulation in the regulatory bodies. Yeah, that's all, thanks. Can you mention something on the pressuring points? Do we have yeah, yeah, just as long as it's like a few, you know, a couple of sentences will be fantastic. So I can oh, just to follow up because uh, Javari is, is very, yeah, she already say, said everything. I wanted to say as well that if you have this, if you are coming from this structural inequality point of view, we, we should 
demand from policymakers and economists to then develop policies that will reduce inequalities that we, we see in this uh, you know, financial system. And that's interesting because many people say, oh, I don't like affirmative action. But I think we should think that for 200 years or plus, white people are benefit, being benefited from affirmative action in a way because the system is, is racist. Mm -hmm. And I think the other aspect is lawmakers, we need to push for lawmakers to consider uh, legislation that would make the process of lending more transparent in, in financial activities. And uh, you know, there's a, a study looking to UK of how black households do not have access to credit market, uh, you know, excluded from the, the credit market. And although it's not clear the explanation as to why, but we can again dig into this, this uh, legacy of colonialism, there's also the issue of the model that is used. You know, it's, uh, we, there, there are some issues regarding the, the scoring, uh, I forgot the name of the model now, I think the credit scoring model and how perhaps the model itself may have imbued kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, whatever is built, it may have a bias against uh, black people. So you need also to push to question the methods that we are using within the financial system and, and, and that's guiding our lending practices. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's a really important point. And I think there's just so much more to talk about on this topic. So I hope that um, we've given you all a taste uh, of the kind of massive topics around racism, money and banking, the whole economy, um, history of slavery and, and colonialism. Um, and you've, you know, got into it over your um, lunch break and, and I think the key is that this is a start of a much bigger conversation. So I just want to say a, a huge thank you to our three panellists for their really excellent insights um, uh, on this topic and obviously thank our audience which will just name a few more places people are from because I didn't get to before um, but we've had people from the Philippines, South Africa, India, Ghana and Poland as well as in the UK, um, Leeds, Gloucester, Reading, um, Hartford and Brighton and, and many more so really appreciate the fact that people are coming from you know all over to, to talk about this topic. Mm -hmm. um, you know I think you know there's clearly a lot of unlearning we, we we all need to do and particularly you know talking to um our, our white audience that positive money has is predominantly and so i think you know although sometimes when we talk about system change it can feel a bit disempowering because it feels like there's so much to do but actually you know we can start start off with ourselves and our communities and that's a really important part of this conversation um so yeah i just want to say thank you again and just highlight that we are going to have another webinar in a couple of weeks which will delve into um, some of these areas but also looking more recently at the um, mix of the uh, covid crisis inequality and debt um, thanks again and we will continue these conversations no doubt and have a good afternoon everyone Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Fred. <laughs>